Turn again, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 14 through 16 tonight. And then Paul tells Timothy this, but as for you, verse 14, continue in what you've learned and have firmly believed. I love that. We're going to come back to that. So underline it, start knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scriptures breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now, so again, what we're talking about is the scripture. And before we go any deeper, I want to give you some facts. I want to give you some statistics done by the Barna Group not too long ago. These were done in 2019, so it's not too long ago, okay? And I want to give you these, and they're going to be on the screen, all right? 92%. 92% of Americans say that they believe in God. 92%. That's, that's higher than I thought it would have been. All right, give me the next one, Mark. Uh, 74% of Americans believe in life after death. Okay, next one. 63% of Americans say their scriptures are the word of God. You can probably see where we're going with this by now. 57% of evangelical church attenders believe many religions can lead to eternal life. Last one, is there one more? 70% of all who have a religious affiliation share that belief. Now, I want us to leave those up for a few minutes, but you can see the sliding scale there, right? It's easy for us, it's easy for us to say we believe in God, right? It's even easy for us to say that we buy into the Bible, that we buy into the scriptures until until there's a boundary placed, right? Until there's a limit placed, right? Because we, if you're anything like me, when I read this this past week, my brain jumped to John 14, 6. Anybody know what that says? I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But yet that's so limiting that there's only one way to God the Father. How could a God that loves us so much? How could a God that works all things together for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purposes, how could a God who sent His Son to die for me, who loves the world so much that He gave His one and only Son, right, to be sin, uh, uh, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, right? How could a God be so limiting? How could a God be so limiting? I know I just mashed like two verses together. I did that intentionally, okay, right? But, but how could he be so limiting? There has to be more than one way. And what we see here are two things that this survey suggests. Number one, a growing religious tolerance of pluralism. Okay, pluralism. That we can buy into multiple beliefs. Okay, how many of you love buffets? Okay, I miss a buffet. Right? I haven't been to a buffet and I can't tell you when. Right? But I, I enjoy me a buffet. And let's just let's just go ahead and get something out of the way right off the bat. Okay? Because I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna embellish some things and I'm I'm gonna talk about some things. Let's just let's just get it out of the way that no buffet is a healthy choice. <laughs> right? I mean if you've made the decision to do buffet you're already, you're already sinning, right? I mean, <laughs> gluttony's there, right? I mean, you, you're, just, you're just making it, you're just, you're just going. You're going all in, right? You make the most of it, okay? Um, but, but if you're anything like me, go to a buffet, leave, leave the green stuff alone, right? I mean, anything green, uh-uh, like not worth it, right? If I'm going, again, if I'm going buffet, we're going all out, Right? I, my favorite buffets are the one that have the soft serve ice cream machine right there, because then you can have like an ice cream cone in between each plate, <laughs> right? So it's not like you're just over, you're just eating all three meals at one sitting, right? Anyway, like I, and so you leave the green things alone, but but you you know definitely going to pick some of this, you're definitely going to pick some of that, 
You're going to get some mashed taters. You're going to get this. You're going to get that, right? And, and, and we pick and choose what we put on our plate. Because each one of us bring a plate to the buffet, right? A new plate every trip, okay? Each one of us bring a plate to the buffet, and we pick and choose. The problem we have when it comes to the scriptures is that that's the way that we try to treat the scriptures. Is that there's things in the scriptures that I like and that I want to highlight and that I want to mention often, right? There are promises in the scriptures that mean things to me and that meant something to me at pivotal points in my life that I like to make much of. But then there are other pieces of scripture that I'd rather not touch, right? There are other things on there that, hey, you know what? That can just, that can just stay right in there. I'm not really sure why that's in there. I'm, uh, that, 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 that just seems to cause more confusion, right? Like, um, like judges. I mean, let's just get rid of that whole thing, right? I mean, no, but like, like there are confusing pieces of Scripture that we would rather not put on our plate because we don't know what to do with them, because they're limiting, because they cause confusion, because they, 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 they look like God's a mean God or something like that, right? And so we treat the scriptures like our own personal buffet and pick and choose what we like, which leads to this idea of pluralism, because then we do that with all, all types of religion, right? I can take a little bit of this because that makes me feel good. I can take a little bit of this because, man, these people are just free, right? I can take a little bit of this. I can take a little bit of this, and I've created my own religion. And we see that reflected in these statistics, don't we? The second thing that these surveys suggest is that it's evidence that Americans either dismiss or do not know the fundamental teachings of their faith. That we either dismiss or just flat out don't know the fundamental teachings of our faith. We dismiss or we don't know the fundamental teachings of our faith. And the reality is, the hard part for me, preaching this now a third time today, is that I'm not convinced some of us care. Like, I'm not convinced, and and hear my heart here, hear my heart here, I'm not convinced that some of us aren't bothered by that. Just Just keep preaching, man, and I'll keep showing up, and I'll keep giving it to your capital campaign. I'll keep doing this. We'll keep the church afloat. This is just what I've got to do on Sunday morning, but I don't want it to affect my life outside of this. And we've got churches that are filled with this group of people that are content with dismissing or not fully understanding the fundamentals of why we're here. And, the, and, and, and i got to be honest with you, that breaks my heart for you, not for me, for you. Because I read this thing and realize how much you're missing out on. If we just dismiss this and say, hey, look, you keep, you keep doing you and I'll keep doing me, I'm satisfied with my plate. No. No. Don't limit what God can do in and through your life by dismissing and becoming satisfied with less than what He sent His Son to die for you for. Don't. And so my plea for you today and the next couple weeks as we talk about the scriptures is dive into them. Dive into them. Wrestle with the tensions of the scriptures that that don't sit right with you. Like I've I've come to grips. I've come to grips with the fact that I'm not going to understand and comprehend everything in here this side of heaven. Like, I've got that list in my mind of conversations that God and I are going to have when I get to heaven about some things that are written in here. And you know what God's going to probably do? You know what I'm going to probably do? Throw that list right out the window once I get to heaven because it's just not going to matter. It's just not going to matter anymore. Right? But I've got, I just want you to know, like, I'm with you. I'm, hu- I'm human too. 
right? I've got my questions, and I'm, I hate bringing this one up because I feel like I feel like it could be seen as a crutch, but my brother with a disability in a wheelchair, I've got questions for God, right? Like, hello, do you not see this? <laughs> He's suffering. You could do something about this. Would you please just do something about this, right? Set him free. Set, I mean, like, do something. You know, I've got questions, but I've read Isaiah 55, that his ways are not our ways, his thoughts are not our thoughts, as high as the heavens are above the earth are his thoughts and my thoughts. And that's where faith and the scriptures come together. Is that we've got to become okay with the fact that we're not going to understand and comprehend everything in this book, this side of heaven. And that's faith. And that's faith. But my hope for you, my plea for you, is that we will look at our relationship with the Scriptures over these next few weeks and that it'll deepen. Because it seems that most of us, most Americans, don't feel that their religion is the only way to eternal life. Even if their faith tradition teaches otherwise. And the key word there is feel. Right? The key word there is feel. And this approach to faith-based uh, truths is reinforced by feelings rather than facts, right? And here at Summit, one of the things that you need to know, and don't walk out at this point, wait until I tell a bad joke so you can use that excuse. But you need to know that if you're going to be around here, one of the things that we value is believing the truth of God's Word. We're going to value that. Because if we don't, this is a show. And I don't want to waste your time or mine with a show. And so we believe and we preach the truth of God's Word, and there's three things about the truth of God's Word that I want to talk about tonight. And I want to go ahead and tell you that they all begin with P, and I worked really hard on that. And so I expect a cookie at the end of this thing, okay? So you better text somebody. The first one I want to talk about is that the written word of God is purposeful. It has purpose. It has purpose. It's purposeful. Paul tells Timothy, all scripture is breathed out by God, right? All scripture breathed out by God and profitable for teaching. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching. I know, Jonathan, isn't that crazy? Right? Is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching. And, and go back to verse 16. Because he says, excuse me, not 16. Where's he at? Where's he at? Uh, um, 14. Go back to 14. But as for you, continue in what you've learned and firmly believed. Okay? That phrase right there, firmly believed, that's conviction. Okay? That's conviction. Right? And so what he's saying there, as for you, continue in what you've learned and have conviction about, right? Have conviction about. My fear for us is that some of us are walking through based on feelings and not convictions. What's the difference? I'm glad you asked, okay? Feelings are based on us. Convictions are based on the Holy Spirit, okay? Convictions come from the Holy Spirit. Conviction about something, anything, name something, right? Conviction about something comes from the Holy Spirit, okay? Um, I should probably be convicted about buffets, but that's between me and the Holy Spirit, okay? Like, but you can get, you get it, right? You get the picture, okay? I'm, I told you, I haven't been to one in a while. I'm just thinking like way back, right? All right? But it firmly believed. That's conviction because it comes from the Holy Spirit. See, God makes himself and his will known to us through Scripture, God makes himself and his will known to us through Scripture. In fact, in John chapter 20, we talked about this either last week or the week before. He says, he says, many other signs and wonders were done that are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may have life, right? By knowing him and knowing his will, okay? And so our text states here, all Scripture is inspired, breathed out by God and useful for teaching, 
useful for teaching, profitable for teaching. So when we say God breathed, what we're saying is that the that the scripture is inspired. And when we say inspired, we believe the fact that the Bible is inspired by God, which gives it a unique authority. What we're saying when we say that all scriptures breathed out by God is that God has a unique and, let's go ahead and say it, ultimate authority. Jesus said in Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go make disciples, right? And so when we're talking about the scriptures, what we're talking about is a text that has authority over our lives. And so our, one, one of our relationships to the scriptures should be one of submission. That when I approach the scriptures, right, when I approach Bible reading, okay, God, I'm opening the scriptures. What do you want to say to me? What do you want to say to me? What do you want to upend in my life right now? What pride do you want to point out? What place do you need to break my heart for something that breaks yours? Right? That happened Friday night. I've been hearing all day about the David Platt secret church thing and talking about how 1% of mission, foreign mission money goes to unreached people groups. That's sad. And there were some people that were here Friday night that got their hearts broken for missions and for how we reach people for the, for the kingdom. Right? But every time I open the scriptures, I'm placing myself in submission to it. I'm placing myself in submission to it. And when we give the scripture that authority over our lives, it's hard to become apathetic. It's easy to become apathetic if this just becomes another book. It's easy to become apathetic to the things of God and to the scriptures when this is just something that we do, right? But when we have relationship with the God of the Bible and we see this as the authority, the love letter that he has given to us, then we can fight apathy in the scriptures by placing ourselves under the authority of scripture and submission to it. Y'all with me? All right, I just want to make sure. All right, three or four of you, probably the same three or four of you that were ready to sing. Okay. And then useful or profitable, okay, useful or profitable, my iPad's at like 10%, so we got to roll, all right, <laughs> because if that dies, we're going to be in trouble, all right, useful or profitable, all right, we believe the fact that the Bible is useful in giving a unique and God-given purpose. When I read the scriptures, purpose comes from it. When I read the scriptures every morning, typically most, my, my goal is to have quiet time every time. I'm being, being a little vulnerable here. My goal every morning is to have quiet time by 10 a.m. By 10 a.m. Okay? Um, well, pastor, it should be the first thing that you do. Okay, have my four kids for a couple of days and see. <laughs> All right? Because one of, I mean, you just never know who's going to wake up and when. That's the goal. And I used to be able to wake up before everybody else. And now it's just, you just never know, right? You just never know. And so I, I set a bar that by 10 a.m., quiet time happens, scripture happens in my life. And when I read the scriptures, right, I pick one thing out. One thing. Okay, this is the one thing I'm going to meditate on for the day, right? One thing I'm going to meditate on for the day. And it's amazing how many conversations I'll have that day where that one thing comes up, where that one thing comes up, where that one thing comes up. And it's almost like God's in control of the whole thing and had a purpose for giving you that one thing and placing that one thing in your life, in your path, so that you could have three or four conversations later that day about convictions because you read Paul's plea to Timothy about what he firmly believed in. Right? You see how that works? And so the scriptures are profitable. One other thing we've got to talk about here, because I think it's fun. Okay? And some of you have heard me talk about this before. But one of the most popular things that churches and denominations are coming up with now is, about the scriptures is that you can do away with, don't preach about the Old Testament. Okay? But here's the thing. You don't have the new without the old. 
You don't recognize the need for Jesus in Matthew without reading Job. Right? You don't recognize it. You don't recognize the need for a Savior without reading the story of Noah. You don't realize the hope that we have in a future without looking into Jeremiah. Right? And so when, it, when, when, when Paul tells Timothy, all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for, for teaching, he means all. Genesis to Revelation. And not just for that culture and that time was Paul telling Timothy this. He was telling it for the church of 2021. That all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching. Y'all with me? All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching. The written Word of God has a purposeful function in our lives. A purposeful function in our lives. Number two, the written Word of God is powerful. The written Word of God is powerful. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, Paul tells the church at Rome, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. Paul says here, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the good news. I'm not ashamed of the scriptures, right? And when he says this, he's making two assertions. Number one, he states his pride, and I love this. I love this. He states his pride in the good news or the gospel of Jesus. He states his pride. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. But then secondly, secondly, he stated the source of his pride. It's the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes. And when we see that word power in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, that's the Greek word dunamis. Okay, dunamis. Everybody say dunamis. Good, awesome. Oh, that, was, that was pretty good. Okay, the Greek word dunamis. It's a derivative of the word dynamite. Any pyros in here that love 4th of July? Okay, very good, very good, right? It's a derivative of the word dynamite. When we think of dynamite, right, we think of, we think of something explosive. We think of something blown up, right? I think, of, I think of 4th of July, right? But a better understanding of the word dynamite or power is, is to think of something as having great effect or great potential, right? When, 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 I, when I get fireworks, okay, whew, so fun, right? <laughs> The bigger the mortar, the bigger the boom, right? And so when I'm sizing my fireworks up, right, I'm saving the big ones for last, right? Because I know these babies have the best, the most potential to wow and wake up the neighbors, <laughs> right? And so, and so I get excited. And so it's less about the explosiveness of the thing, more about the great effect and the great potential of the thing. And so what, what he's saying here is that for, for, for it is the power, it is the effect, it is the potential of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And so the idea is not to think of the Word of God as having great destructive power, but great life-changing power, great life-changing potential. It is the power that moves mountains and changes lives for God and good. Listen, we've, we've made this known often. If something happened to me, and this is the last message I ever preached, y'all be fine. There's nothing special about this vessel. Zan could get up here and preach next Sunday night, faithful to the Word of God, and God would still move. God would still move. There's nothing special about the vessel. If God had a different plan for me that started tomorrow, God would still move here. As long as we we're obedient. Right? There's nothing special. It is faithfulness to the scriptures. Where churches and, 
And we, we are going wrong these days is putting our faith in Zan and Travis and Ian and Steve and Rick Warren, Jeff Willis. Those are two names that deserve to be on the same level. Don't you think? Rick Warren, Jeff Willis, Dylan, right? Scott Tauby, Eric Samuelson, Scott Lynn Scott, you know, my, my friends in ministry in the area. We place them on those pedestals, and then when they fall and they mess up and they sin, like the sinners that they are, our worlds are shattered. Why? Because our faith wasn't in the authority of the scriptures, it was in the, it was in the it was in the man, it was in the person. Um. The scriptures have great power, have great power. I will never forget the first youth pastor position I took. It was in North Carolina, and um, graduated college, moved down on graduation day. The next day, started full-time in ministry. I was ready. I was ready. And, um, and went into a youth group. We were a portable church meeting in an elementary school. And, and when you're a portable church meeting in an elementary school, it's unique because everything about your church has to fit in a trailer. And so there were 13 kids in this youth group. And I went the first, the first Sunday, I didn't, I didn't teach, I didn't preach, I was just introduced to the kids. And all 13 kids came up, and the youth leader came to me, and they said, she said, you want to know, you want to know the best thing about our youth group, the best thing, the best thing that happens here? I was like, what? She said, beanbag chairs. The beanbags. She's like, that's why the kids come back. The beanbags. I was like, awesome. Next day, I go to my first staff meeting. After my first staff meeting, the Worship pastor Brandon calls me into his office, and Brandon's like, look, we're really trying to figure out how to fit some more equipment onto the trailer. And since you're new, I was thinking, because the, the, the thing that takes up the most space on the trailer are the 20 beanbag chairs. So would you think about getting rid of the beanbags? And I was like, okay. And so I was thinking about it, and I was like, well, let me just go and teach one youth group time, and let's just see how it goes. Show up the next Sunday, start teaching, and uh, about five minutes in, everybody starts getting kind of restless and moving on those beanbags. It was obnoxious. Man, like the, you could hear every movement, right? And so I'm up there teaching, I'm talking, right? And my first message, I was so pumped, I'm the youth pastor dude, right? Had my hair all gelled, right? And, um, and, and, and I couldn't focus on the message because these kids were just moving and, and, and shifted. And then we got to the end of the message, and the sixth and seventh grade boys thought it would be an awesome idea to take the beanbags and just start whacking all the girls with them, okay? Which is called flirting. I learned that in school, okay? But, but it became, they, they became so destructive. I'm shocked they did So I went to Brandon right after church, and I'm like, yeah, let's ditch the beanbags. <clears throat> My, the youth leader came to me, and she said, if you ditch those beanbags, you're going to kill this youth group two weeks in. I was like, it's okay. It's okay. I've got a plan. I had no plan <laughs> other than just ditching the beanbags. The next Sunday, the kids walked in, and um, I, I, I found our new, our new tool. We found 15 tan um, metal without the cushion chairs covered in rust, right? And we set those bad boys up, and we put a Bible on each chair. It was awesome, and that's all we had. I took our storage from the trailer from being the biggest thing to nothing because all we needed was Bibles, and the chairs were already there. So it was like a tote of Bibles. And our youth group in the first six months grew from 13 to 120. Why? Not because we, we were doing, not because we were doing Mountain Dew and Snickers. Although that's fun, and we did do that, just not on Sunday morning. There's nothing like, and I laid the gauntlet down at 8.15 this morning, our elder team, Zan, get ready, 
and we're going to have a competition at some point. We may have to Facebook Live this, right? Because one of my favorite games was who can eat a Snickers bar and down a can of Mountain Dew the fastest, all right? And so I'm going to take on the elders, and we're going to see who can do this. At some point, we just got to do it, Zan, okay? All right, it's going to be fun. We'll, we'll get the executive team in because I don't want Jeff to miss out. All right, so we'll just do this, okay? <laughs> Snickers bar, Mountain Dew, it'll be so fun, okay? Right? So we did those things, but we just didn't do them on Sunday morning because Sunday morning came about the Word of God. That's what mattered. And you know what? We found out that that's what teenagers craved. Truth. And I'm finding it's what all people crave. The truth of God's Word. It's powerful. It has the power to save. It has the power to change. It has the power to save. It has the power to change. And lastly, the written Word of God is permanent. The written Word of God is permanent. Look at these verses. Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Psalm 119.89, forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. So Isaiah 48, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God will stand forever. 1 Peter 1.23, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. I want you to notice some words here, okay? I want you to notice some words. My words will not pass away. Firmly fixed. Firmly fixed. Stand forever not of perishable, but imperishable, living and abiding. We talked about abiding last week, the dwelling, right? That the Word of God is dwelling within us. Not pass away, firmly fixed, stand forever, living and abiding Word of God. The Scriptures are permanent. See, all truth has permanence. Truth endures. Two plus two equals... Four, jerk. <laughs> he said five. There's one in every group, right? Two, facts are facts. If two plus two is four, then two plus two is four anywhere and everywhere, right? It's always true. It's always equaled four, not five, okay? Although I always say that too, so... You know, now I know how my teachers always felt. And God's word has always been and will always be God's word. Even if the world as we know it goes up in smoke. Even if a pandemic hits. No matter who the president is tomorrow or next election. No matter no matter what. No matter what happens, no matter what comes, no matter what loss, no matter what celebration, no matter what comes, God's word. It's true, and it's permanent. That's why we place such a high value on the Word of God. There's many uncertainties in life, but His Word is not one of them. We build our faith and practice on the fact that the Bible is God's Word. We have faith because we believe the Word of God to be true, not based on our feelings, but based on truth. That's why John wrote in his epistle, 1 John 5.13, I've written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Philippians 4.6, Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now see, here's the thing about scriptures. There's three... There's, there's three categories that we can put beliefs in. Opinions, convictions, and absolutes. Everybody can have opinions about anything. I'm not going to argue with you about your opinions. Everybody's entitled to their wrong opinions. Okay? Sports teams, buffets, just bring that one full circle. Um, you know... All, all kinds of different opinions. Coffee, iced or hot, right? Everybody's entitled to their, to their opinions. And I'm not going to fight with anybody over an opinion, right? Convictions. 
Again, this is something Holy Spirit driven, right? And so I might try to tell you or testify to you about why I have the conviction that I have about this or that, right? Some people have conviction about no tattoos, right? Some people have convictions about alcohol and, 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 different, and different things um, that, that not everybody shares, right? And so I may have conversation with you about a conviction that I have or a conviction that you have, but at the end of the day, if we still differ based on convictions, I recognize that God's way of working with convictions is personal. And so it's okay that I share a different conviction than you share. It's okay that you share a different conviction than they share, right? As long as at the end of the day, we can still love each other. As long as at the end of the day, we can still be nice to each other and say, you know what? God just hasn't worked on me in that area. Or maybe he's worked on me more on that area than he has you. And maybe he's just deal, dealing with this other thing in my life right now. And I'm, not, I'm just not really there yet. Right? And then there's absolutes. And absolutes are places... Well, I used to say that they're, they're, they're things we hold in the closed hand. That we'd fight to the death over. Things we hold in the open hand, opinions, I wouldn't shed a paper cut over. But absolutes, holding the closed hand, I'd, I'd fight to the death over. Scripture, the authority of Scripture. One way to heaven, John 14, 6. The Trinity, one God, three expressions. As hard as it is to kind of wrap our mind around God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, being one God, right? And there's many different ways to explain it. My favorite is the one God, three expressions, but, but I, I've heard it explained as an egg, right? Because you have one egg, but there's three parts to the egg. You've got the shell, you've got the yolk, and then you've got the, the white, right? The egg white, right? And so you've got, you got three parts of the egg, but it's one egg, right? And that's the Trinity, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the virgin birth, right? And, and how you know an absolute is, is an absolute is something that you can defend and explain through Scripture. That the Bible clearly talks about from Scripture. Okay? The problem we have when it comes to the authority of Scripture and our relationship with others is that we make opinions absolutes. We make convictions out of opinions. In fact, in fact, I'm convinced, I'm convinced, I'm convinced, and I opened up a couple weeks ago about, about, about some churches that, that are in my life. One's in North Carolina, one's in Massachusetts, and so they're, they're nobody around here, so don't get on the gossip train and, 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 or do anything like that, right? But, but I, I, know, I know two churches right now that are struggling and they're having conversations about splitting, and it's over opinions and convictions has nothing to do with absolute. And so many, so many damaging things have happened within the body of Christ because we've confused these three things and majored on minor things instead of looking into the Word of God. We've allowed our feelings to rule the day and not the Scripture. And I finished this message on Thursday. I got 3%. I finished this message on Thursday. And on Friday, this is it, a friend of mine posted this on Facebook. He's a pastor down in Nashville, Tennessee. And he said this, it's becoming more and more challenging to stand on the authority of Scripture. God's Word. Men and women everywhere are working to alter its message for the sake of cultural acceptance. Doing this makes it their word and no longer God's word. Friends, the gospel is a stumbling block. To change that is not to help anyone. We must stand on the word. We don't celebrate that it's a stumbling block, for that should break our hearts. Yet nonetheless, we continue praying for our hearts to be transformed so that they see the word of God as a stepping stone of grace and no longer a stumbling block along their trajectory. He goes on and says, let's not drift towards silence of God's word. He keeps writing. 
Don't be a jerk. I love that. Be humble and kind. Bold, brave, and sweet. Don't alter Scripture's message for the sake of cultural acceptance. By faith, speak the word. Be kind and gracious. Be kind and gracious. Doing this makes it their word and no longer God's word. My question for us today is very simply. Worship team's going to come. What does it look like to put your trust in the scriptures? What does it look like to put your trust in the Bible and to the Word of God? What does it look like to put your faith here? Maybe a better question for us tonight is what's our relationship with this? What's our relationship with this? And are you willing to take your relationship deeper with the Word of God? Are you willing to walk with someone through the Scriptures? Are you willing to show up at Aroma Joe's and say, hey, let's read John 4 and let's get coffee together on Tuesday and let's just talk about it. Let's just talk about it. What, are you getting out of, what did you get out of John 4? The woman at the well. All right. What's your relationship with the Scriptures and are you willing to make an effort to have a deeper relationship with the Word of God? There are so many resources at our fingertips. We have, we have one here, the Word for you today. It's, a, it's one that, that a lot of our folks read through and love. We have Bible studies that meet all throughout the week. There's an app for that. There are so many apps on your phone that you can download and you can go through Bible studies and you can read the Scriptures. You can even do them as part of a community. Right, If you join the Bible app and you can become friends through the Bible app, I became friends with Dave Champa. I don't even know how I became friends with Dave Champa through the Bible app, but I get an email every time Dave Champa creates an image, a scripture image on the Bible app. And I love it because I see Dave's active on the Bible app. Right, Might be one of the kids. But I see that a Champa is, Apple, is, active, Apple, is active on the Bible app. All right, so there's even ways you can have accountability and create accountability with the scriptures through technology. But the deeper question and the first question we have to answer is what's our relationship with the scriptures and are we willing to take that relationship deeper? Are we willing to say, you know what, by tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., I'm going to read I'm going to read the scriptures. Right? I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to set a goal 4 days this week. I'm going to read the Bible. Right? I'm I'm, I'm going to set a goal that I'm going to Talk to two people about holding me accountable with scriptures. Whatever it takes, are we willing to grow in our relationship with the Bible? And I pray your answer is yes. I pray your answer is yes. Because it's permanent. It has the power to change your life. And it gives us purpose. It has purpose in our lives. Will you pray with me? God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you for the power of your word. I thank you for the purpose that's found in your word. And I thank you that your word is timeless. God, I thank you that, that there's nothing new under the sun. That we, can, that we can read in your word that Jesus experienced the same range, the, the same form of temptation that we experienced yet remained without sin. God, that the Bible is not out of date, it's not out of touch, but that, God, it's relevant, it's powerful. The places where we say it's out of date and out of touch are just so that we can ignore the truths and the authority that we're seeing. And God, I pray that we would surrender our lives to the authority of your word. That we would value, that we would value the, that your word, your scriptures, your love letter to us. So high. That we would place such a high value on the Bible. Knowing that it has the authority and the power to change our lives. Knowing that it's timeless and it's permanent. 
knowing its purpose, discovering its purpose in our lives. So God, I pray for each and every one of us to go deeper in our relationship with your word. God, maybe that means picking up a Bible tonight before we leave. Maybe that means having a conversation with somebody before I leave saying, hey, I need you to hold me accountable. I want to read the Bible three times this week. Whatever it takes, would we be willing? Would you move our hearts to taking a step of faith and trust in our relationship with you and your word? In Jesus' name I pray.